Kevin Harvick gives his take on where it all went wrong for Haley Deegan, Trackhouse makes a big move, and NASCAR may bring their next street race to a city near you. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. We have a very full show today. Pull over a chair, sit back, relax. You're going to want to take it all in. We are going to time travel in today's episode. We're going to start in the past. Our next story will be more present day focused. Then we're going to talk about the future. So starting with the past. Remember five, six years ago, Kevin Harvick was one of Haley Deegan's most vocal allies. The NASCAR Cup Series champion once raced wheel to wheel versus Deegan in a K&N West race. Afterwards, he said of all the drivers in that field, she had the most potential. Roughly a year after Harvick heaped that praise on Haley Deegan, she made the announcement that she was leaving the Toyota development system for Ford. And this week, Kevin Harvick on his Happy Hour podcast said that was the moment it all went wrong for Haley Deegan. Harvick said, quote, I don't think that guidance and mentorship has been exactly what Deegan needed for NASCAR. The big mistake was getting out of the Toyota development system. I think Ford has the worst development program as far as their drivers go. I think Toyota has the best and Chevy is somewhere in the middle. Getting out of that Toyota development program with all the resources, and they're willing to give time, I think that she needed more time in the truck series, getting that guidance and mentorship she needed in order to develop what she needed to be a NASCAR race car driver. I think that she got pushed through too fast and wound up in the wrong development system for her to be successful. I think the moment she stepped outside of that Toyota development system was a bad move. That is a lot from Kevin Harvick. You can click the top link down below to listen to the full episode of Happy Hour. That's become one of my favorite weekly podcasts. Kevin Harvick often gets brutally honest like this. And overall, reacting to what he actually just said, and he did say a lot, I largely agree with him. Toyota certainly has the most fully fleshed out NASCAR development pipeline. They've got multiple competitive teams in ARCA. They've got Tricon Garage is great in trucks and Xfinity. You have Joe Gibbs, Sam Hunt in Cup. Now they have three tier one teams. And shoot, even at the grassroots level, they support Brent Cruz, Jade Avedisian, among others. Compare that to Ford. Ford has Thor Sport in trucks. That's a legit championship caliber organization. They also have front row, very good. But the problem for Ford is their Xfinity series lineup is slim. They have the two Stuart Haas cars, I guess by extension the Sieg cars, but then that's about it. AM Racing is decent, but they're very new. They had a good year with Brett Moffitt last season, but I would argue they are not established enough to prop up an inexperienced driver. We saw at Pocono this weekend, they looked lost with Josh Berry behind the wheel. So on that front, I fully agree with Kevin Harvick, but I somewhat disagree. See, again, we got a time travel. Let's go back five years. Haley Deegan, late 2019, announced she was leaving Toyota for Ford 2020. Arca was her first full year with the Blue ovals. If we go back to that time, the Toyota development pipeline was crowded. Back then, Harrison Burton and Riley Herbst were driving Toyotas in the Xfinity series. In trucks, you had Christian Eckes, guys like Chandler Smith, Derek Krause, Austin Hill was driving a Toyota. Obviously, you had Ty Gibbs on the horizon. Young guys like Eric Jones, Christopher Bell had just broken through into Cup. And I remember a while ago seeing comments from Deegan where she said that, hey, Toyota wasn't able to fulfill some of the promises they'd made. She didn't always feel like she was a main priority there. She was just one of the crowd. Whereas at Ford, she immediately became one of their top prospects. Back in 2019, 2020, they had Chase Briscoe and Austin Sindrick in Xfinity. But then in trucks, she had a lot of old guys like Grant Enfinger, Johnny Sauter, Matt Crafton. I mean, you had Ben Rhodes, and I guess you had Todd Gilliland at that time, who we now know is very legit. But my point is, if we go back to 2019, 2020, it wasn't a no-brainer to stay with Toyota. Toyota had lost so many prospects over the years, very crowded, while Ford, meanwhile, established enough, promised to make Deegan one of their main focuses. So at the time, I'm not sure this move looked as terrible as Kevin Harvick and many others are trying to say it was five years later, in hindsight. What I will agree with Kevin Harvick on is that she got moved up into a rough Xfinity series situation. I remember doing a phone interview with Haley Deegan in the summer of 2019, just a couple months before she announced the move from Toyota to Ford. And I remember her talking about then and on a variety of other shows at the time that she didn't want to rush through the lower ranks of NASCAR. You know, let me just see if I can find the clip. It's been a while. 
I would rather stay down in the level in K&N for an extra year just because there's those drivers that make those mistakes of moving too quick and then it costs them five years of their career that they could have potentially had in Cup or in Xfinity or wherever they're at. And so I'd rather kind of give up that extra year. Okay, it's going to take me a little bit longer, but in the end, my career is going to be so much better. Harvick says she rushed through the lower ranks. I think in some cases that's true. Like Arca, she only spent one year and didn't win any races. I would have stayed for another season, get a trophy. But then when she got to trucks, first with DGR and then later with Thor Sport, those are established quality teams. She spent three years in trucks and didn't get any better, statistically speaking. She got a good amount of seat time those three years. She was put into a bad Xfinity Series situation. I think we can say that. Like, Haley Deegan started racing stock cars at, what, 15, 16, 17 years old? That's late in the game compared to most of her peers. She needed to go to an established team that could coach her. That's not AM Racing. AM Racing is decent enough, gets decent support from Ford, but they need an established driver that can show them where they're lacking. So that pairing, Deegan and AM Racing, just did not align. That's why that partnership failed halfway through their first season together. So overall, I do agree with Kevin Harvick's very strong comments. He wrapped up this portion of their podcast by saying it's going to be tough for Haley Deegan to get another opportunity in NASCAR. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be tough to get another chance. That's going to be the hard part. Yeah. Haley Deegan is racing this weekend in the Speed Tour All-Star Race event at Lime Rock Park. She was also spotted recently at Iowa Speedway during the IndyCar Indy Lights weekend. Not sure what's happening there if anything. Like I said a couple weeks ago, Haley Deegan is still young enough and talented enough to develop into a good stock car racer. But even if she doesn't end up at the top level of NASCAR one day, she clearly has the tools to race something and to win in something. I hope she's able to make that happen. Whew, moving on. I told y'all this would be a long episode. So we talked about the past. We flashed back to 2019, 2020. Now let's talk about the present. Big news today. Trackhouse has a new partner. Avenue Sports Fund, which was founded by former Milwaukee Bucks owner Mark Lazary. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, I'm sorry. They have purchased a sizable minority stake in Trackhouse Entertainment Group. Justin Marks, Trackhouse co-owner, told Bloomberg, quote, The money from Avenue will be invested in several areas, including technology to boost performance on the track and fan engagement. That sounds like good news for Trackhouse fans. Trackhouse is one of General Motors' key NASCAR teams, but they've struggled to find the speed this season. Daniel Suarez has a win, but only has one top 10 the last, I think, 12 races? Might be 13 now. And Ross Chastain has been more consistent, but hasn't been able to win a race and now sits precariously in the 16th spot on the playoff grid. So any investment that could help performance will surely be welcomed. But from a business standpoint, this is a huge deal for one of the biggest disruptors in the NASCAR Cup Series garage. Trackhouse is expected to acquire a third charter for next season. They've already pushed the envelope in terms of at-track hospitality. They've built out their areas around their haulers, added screens, decorations. They are leading that charge the past couple of seasons. Now they're also in MotoGP and I believe recently scored their first first podium in that series. Sports continue to be very popular amongst investors, and I've noticed ownership groups seem to be more and more common. Like, for example, I saw a headline the other day that the famous U.S. goalkeeper Tim Howard became part of the ownership group of my hometown Houston Dynamo in Houston Dash. On the racing side, we joke sometimes, but LeBron James is part of the Fenway group, so technically he has an ownership stake in RFK Racing. Just this week, Kevin Harvick became part of the ownership group of the Charlotte Checkers American Hockey League team. Harvick, Dale Jr., Justin Marks, and Jeff Burton formed an ownership group recently and now own the Cars Tour. Joe Gibbs Racing last year sold off a minority stake of their team to the Harris Blitzer Sports Entertainment Group. This is becoming a trend, and I expect that if and when the next charter agreement is signed, this trend will only continue. And it makes sense because groups naturally have wide ranging business interests and NASCAR is appealing because of those B2B crossover marketing opportunities. This is an exciting move for Trackhouse. We'll see if it translates to improved on-track performance this year or next, but I think more than anything, it's indicative of a trend that is only going to continue once the next charter deal presumably gets signed. I would expect more ownership groups 
to become interested in NASCAR in the coming years. Past, present, now let's talk about the future. Let's start with the immediate future. This weekend, Hendrick Motorsports announced that Kyle Larson will run the Coca-Cola 600 double paint scheme, which is awesome. He's finally going to get to race this scheme in an actual NASCAR event. I think that's awesome. It's a great looking scheme. The orange looks nice. The design looks nice. But at the same time, part of me just wants to forget about that miserable Memorial Day weekend and the turmoil that followed it. So seeing this scheme on track is a cruel reminder of that uh, of that rough few days. But I am glad Larson is ultimately getting to run this scheme in a NASCAR race. That's cool. I'm sure a lot of fans will love that. But now let's talk distant future. Reporter Adam Stern posted, At Chicago earlier this month, NASCAR hosted officials from other cities in the U.S. interested in hosting a street circuit race in the future, as the property continues to see interest in the concept. Hmm, very interesting. I think most folks expect NASCAR to go back to Chicago at least for one more year, but after 2025, it could be wide open. And if I look at a map of the United States and I try to pick out markets or regions that may be starved for NASCAR racing, I immediately look west, mountain time. How about Denver, Colorado? It could get warm there in the summer, but maybe a race in June before it gets too hot. You'd have to make sure you don't conflict with the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb that takes place about an hour and a half away in Colorado Springs, I think usually in June, if I'm not mistaken. But Denver, Colorado, I think would be an awesome market for a NASCAR street race. Logistics, I have no idea. Just be cool to see. Another city, again, when I look at this map of the United States that pops into my mind is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a big city, five hours away from Pocono, five hours away from Michigan. I think it's six hours from Indianapolis. You've got the whole state of Ohio right there. Again, I'm not sure about logistics, but if NASCAR can cram a street race into the center of Chicago, Illinois on 4th of July weekend, then anything's possible. Beyond Denver, Pittsburgh, I look at the West Coast. We talked about Long Beach early in the year with all the ownership shufflings there. Maybe that's not likely anymore. Portland or Seattle could be cool. Again, I'm not sure about logistics, but we've seen the turnout for Xfinity Series racing there in recent seasons. Obviously, there's Mexico City, Montreal, which are very real possibilities. That sort of fits this street race description. I don't know where NASCAR is seriously considering, but in my opinion, I would love to see one street race a year. Next year, I hope they go back to Chicago for hopefully a clean and sunny weekend, third time's the charm. But after next year, I think any of these options I just listed would be very interesting. I would welcome NASCAR heading to any one of those cities. I'd be curious to see what they could put together. Um, but let me know if you agree down in the comment section below. And are there any other cities I didn't mention that maybe would be worth a mention. Let me know down in the comment section below. Woo, we made it, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more NASCAR content, commentary, race recaps, and more every single day. And a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. Thank you all for watching. Tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time, I will be streaming live right here on this channel. David Land will be stopping by to talk about the return of the Brickyard 400. Should be a great discussion, fun hangout. Be sure to stop by. That's going to do it, folks. I'll catch you again soon.